the Sabbath. Sabbath. I've been looking forward to our time together. Amen. Amen. You know, it's precious to be in in nature with God. Um, And ministry of healing in these hour of ages, we're told that Jesus, often the early morning found him singing and in meditation and in prayer. And those who are going to be ready to meet Jesus are going to be just like Jesus, aren't they? The early morning needs to find us that same way. Every morning, the intention of Christ. When the sun rose up in the morning, it was to be a test to see who would be ready for the coming of Jesus. You know, the Bible likens Jesus to a son, doesn't it? And Psalm just says, the Lord God is a sun and shield. Every morning when the sun rises in the east, we're told that the coming of Christ is going to come from the east. As the lightning cometh from the east to the west, so all shifts are the coming of the Son of Man be. Every morning, if you're sleeping, instead of welcoming Jesus, you're not going to be ready for the coming of Jesus. God is trying to get us ready for his coming. Oftentimes, he would meet and give special instructions early in the morning, wouldn't he? Morning manners are some of the most precious times of any meetings. Whether we're in a meeting like this, or any time, God is always giving morning men, isn't he? And anciently, when God wanted to teach the importance of morning manna to the children of Israel when they were traveling in the wilderness, every morning God would give them manna, wouldn't he? And when the manna would come, you remember that they were to feed off of that manna every morning. Now, and I ask you a question. What did that manna represent? Two great things. Number one, Jesus said, you remember commenting, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. In one sense, the manna represented the written word of Jesus. And every morning, God has a special revelation from the Bible, from the written word, to reveal to those who will be willing to receive it. But then in another sense, It represented not only this written word, but Jesus in John 6 said, I am the living bread that cometh down from heaven. It represented not only the written word, but it represented the living word, the personal word, Jesus Christ. Every morning, God has a special experience in the word of God. And he has a special experience with the person Jesus for every one of us. But let me let you in on a little secret. When the sun rose up, what happened to the manna? What the Bible say? It did what? I don't hear you. Are you sleeping? It melted, didn't it? Now there was water that came out of a rock later on that day or the other days. Many miracles God did in the daytime, but that manna was gone. And I praise God that there are blessings that we can receive all day long, every day. But there are special revelations from the word of God that you can only get in the morning. There are special experiences with Jesus, the person, that we can only get early in the morning. And so the wise men said, they that seek me early shall find me. There's a special revelation that God wants to give us today. I want it, don't you? I want Jesus. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is about to come. We're living in the final generation. I was just reading the other day of what took place in Bangladesh. You heard about it. That massive cyclone and destruction, thousands of lives perished. And God is trying to tell us probation's hours fast closing and the majority of us we're not ready we don't know Jesus as we should let this weekend be a revival and reformation what do you say this morning we're going to be studying on the subject thy will be done thy will be done if you will reverently kneel with me
our Father. We're so thankful that even in the most holy place that there is a mercy seat. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we can come to Thee and find help in time of need. And we know that one of the greatest, the greatest thing that the devil is doing to present souls from being prepared to meet thee is by involving us in relationships, either married or unmarried, that is not according to thy will. And so we ask that this morning that you will give us a special revelation in your word and with Jesus that will bring us to the place where in every experience of our lives we only want one thing that thy will will be done we pray lord that you'll be with every waiting heart those that are still on their way and that you'll allow our minds to be focused and not distracted that we might comprehend the deep things of god send your spirit now we pray Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and abide with us, Lord. Give us a special Sabbath blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. How many of you brought your notebooks? Praise the Lord. Pen and paper? Praise the Lord. What were the three books yesterday that we said that we needed, along with our Bibles, to really understand the subject we're studying? Adventist Home? Messages to Young People? Ministry of Healing. Everyone that is looking to follow God's will should study these pages earnestly on our knees that we might find out the will of God. Amen. Now we know that in a setting like this, we can only have an introduction. There's no way we can exhaust such a tremendous thing. But I hope that this would introduce you in a way to these books and into these principles that it may guide you as we seek to prepare for eternity. Amen. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You see, brothers and sisters, we are on the verge of a great and stupendous crisis. We are on the verge right now of the crisis over the seal of God and over the mark of the beast. We have been told that in these last days, this world as we know it cannot continue much longer. Everything in our world is in agitation. We see it in the political world. We see it in the environmental world. We see it in the social and the economical world. This world cannot continue much longer. Probation's hour is fast closing. And the majority of us, we don't understand that Satan as a roaring lion is seeking how he may devour us. And God is trying to get us ready in these last days and far more than we do today. We must study the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. For they have more significance to us in these last days than they do in any other generation. In fact, in Matthew 6, you'll notice what the Bible says. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus is giving his great sermon on the mount. And in this sermon, he gives what has been termed the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, brothers and sisters, is a model prayer. Is that right? Amen. This model prayer that God gave 
carries in it a great deal more than what you and I could ever imagine is in this prayer. In this prayer, Jesus has given us the secret of life. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 6, beginning in verses 9. Would you read it with me? Matthew 6, beginning in verses 8. Let's read that together. It says in verses 9, rather, after this manner, Therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, how? In earth, how? As it is in heaven. And that's enough for now. Jesus in this prayer has taught us the secret of life. He said that there is a way that you and I can have heaven right here on this earth. And he taught us to pray, thy will be done in earth, how? As it is in heaven. Now question, how is God's will done in heaven? Just a little of the will of God? Part of the will of God? Or the perfect will of God? Those angels, all they're doing are hearkening unto the commandments of God, unto the words of God, therefore feeling the word of God. And if you and I were carry on that wheel that is taking place in heaven, down here on this earth, we can have heaven on earth. Is that right? The principles of heaven right here on this earth, you and I can have it provided that we do the will of God. Now, brothers and sisters. This wheel, if we will do it, it is the secret to every experience in life. Whether it's in diet or in dress, whether it's in education or association, whether it's in recreation, whether it's in our music or in the way we use our time and money, all we should be seeking to do is one thing. That is to please the Lord according to the will of God. And if we could learn that lesson to live according to the will of God, we could have the experience, as Paul said, of being in heavenly places. Now, brothers and sisters, when we think about that will and we apply it to the experience of courtship and marriage, we must understand that this is even the great lesson that Jesus sealed his experience with while he was on this earth. You remember. That when Jesus was in the shadow of the cross in Gethsemane, thrice he prayed a prayer. And what did he pray? Not my will, but thine. Thine what? Thine will be done. And when you and I learn that lesson as Jesus learned it, it sealed his experience as he was getting ready to go to the cross. When he was in that shadow, he prayed, not my will, but thine, thy will be done. And those who are prepared for the loud cry in the latter rain, those who are prepared for the time of trouble and the seal of God, we read in early writings, page 71, that those who are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. We must come to the experience where in every experience of our life, all we want is just one thing. And what is that? That God's will be done in our lives. Now when we take that and apply it, as I said, to courtship and marriage, that means that the will of God, we are not seeking simply what we want, but we are seeking what God wants. Now how does God reveal his will to us? Is he going to send an angel from heaven and speak with an audible voice and say, now this is my will, how does God reveal his will to us? Through his word. That's one great way, isn't it? Turn to Jeremiah. What book did I say? Jeremiah chapter 10. In fact, before we get there, go to Matthew 7. Then we'll come right back to Jeremiah chapter 10. And I think that very, at the very beginning of our session this morning, we need to come face to face with a great reality. That if the program that I'm giving you today is God's program, do you think that it's going to be like the programs of this world when we deal with courtship and marriage? God forbid is right. I mean, think about it. If we follow the ways of the world and the principles of the world, we can only get the same results that the world gets. Is that right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not impressed with the world's results. 
You know that worldly statistics, they say that the marriages of today, that over 50% of them end up in divorce. And that's not talking about the ones that are still unhappy in marriage. That's simply the ones that end in the divorce court. But there are multitudes that are separated, multitudes that they are legally married, but practically they're divorced. You can live in the same house and be separated from your wife. And that happens long before marriage is entered into. It is in the principles of courtship where these lessons are learned and experienced. And this is why we must understand not our will, but God's will in these principles. Are you with me? And brothers and sisters, heaven's statistics is worse than man's statistics. You know what heaven says? Volume 4 of the testimonies. You should be writing this down. 503, 504. It says that there is not one marriage in a hundred that had resulted happily. Do you believe the testimonies? It says there is not how many? One marriage in 100. From the one who knows, volume 4, Testimonies for the Church, page 503, 504. Now tell me, what is the percentage of that? Less than one. It says there is not one in a hundred, not one in a hundred, which means it's less than one percent. That means that 99% of the marriages, when this was written, 99% was marriages that were unhappy. Now, do you think it got any better today? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse. We are worse today than we were a hundred years ago. We are even less now. That means that over 99% of the marriages today are unhappy marriages. And that's the one who knows. So if we follow the plan that the world is following, that means if we want happiness, how much of the percent are we going to be following? What type of program? That means that 90, uh, over 99% are not going to be doing what we need to be doing to have happiness. Are you with me? Then the plan that I give you, if it's the right plan, if it is a divinely inspired plan, if it's God's plan, will the great majority of the world be following it? Then if you want happiness, you got to be willing to be peculiar and different, don't you? And the reason is this, not that Jesus is simply trying to make us different in the way we carry on courtship and, and, and marriage, but the reality is this, if we're doing what the world is doing, we are going to get the results that the world is getting, do you see? That's just logical, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but I want happiness. Happy is the home that knows the plan of God. In fact, the Bible says the same thing in Matthew 7. What book did I say? Matthew 7, the Bible, in that same Sermon on the Mount, after he shared the thoughts of the Mount of Blessings and the secret to the principles of life, he said in Matthew 7, notice, notice this. Verse 13, it says, Enter ye in where? At the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth where? To destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because... Straight is the gate, and narrow is what? The way that which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now you tell me, which one of the percentages of those who have happiness or, or of the married couples are in the broad road? Which one of those percentages, the 99 or the 1? They're on the road that's leading to destruction and death, is that right? And the 1% is on that road that is leading to life, the less than 1%. And I want to be on that road, which means that the majority of this world are going to be carrying on their courtship and their marriage in a way that guess who is running those courtships? Do you believe that? I'll read it to you. Messages to young people. I guess you didn't know that Satan has his love connection. Did you know that? Messages to young people. Listen to what the prophet says. Messages to Young People, page 450. We read this. Courtship as carried on in this age is a scheme of deception. A what? A scheme of deception in hypocrisy 
with which the enemy of souls has far more to do than, than the Lord. So who is behind most of the courtships of this world? The devil. Now, do you want the devil courting you? It says, good common sense. What? Good common sense is needed here, if anywhere, but the fact is, it has little to do in the matter. And then it goes on to say that there are men that are professed Christians, that they are sensible on every other subject. They can explain the truths that relate to the last days. They understand the work of the present hour, yet they don't understand this idea of courtship and marriage. And that is the only door that Satan needs to get in and neutralize the whole effect of the gospel. We heard it yesterday from the evangelist who spoke it so eloquently when he said that one sin cherished can eventually neutralize the whole gospel. Well, this is the greatest one is Satan can get us into a relationship that has not been ordained by God. He can exercise his skill here than in any other direction. We read about what he did with Samson, one of the strongest physically, didn't we? With Solomon, who was one of the strongest mentally, and with David, who was one of the strongest spiritually. And it was just this one thing, this idea of the relationships. And so if you and I don't understand this, we are leading down a road that will end in destruction and death. And I'm not making this up. You can read Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7, and it says that these relationships lead to hell. Exact words. It's just that serious. What do you say? But if you and I will come back into the mountain with Jesus... If we will behold God's ideal for us, we can have heaven instead of hell. We can have happiness instead of sorrow. We can have joy. And our homes could be a foretaste of heaven right here on this earth. But provided that we follow a plan that is totally peculiar. So now listen to me. As we begin to start studying, we're going to start this morning. Then we're going to go this evening and continue. And then we're going to finish tomorrow. But I want you to see this. Don't expect me to give you a program. And relationships and courtship and marriage, what the world is doing. If you want that program, then you can see someone else. Amen? Amen. But the program that I'm going to give you is one that is not based on my ideas. Not one that is based on the opinions of man or Hollywood. You see, most people get their ideas of courtship and marriage and love and romance from watching the movie screens. They learn their lines, young people and adults, learn their lines from the movies. And repeat the same words, go through the same idea and schemes of deception and hypocrisy. And as a result, they get the results that those Hollywood actors are getting. Nothing but unhappiness. And so I'm not going to use any of that in these classes. What we're going to be studying is the great foundational sources. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now somebody says, well, you're narrow-minded. Yes. Yes. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. My mind is only narrow enough to believe in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Anything more than that, we open up the door for the devil to bring in deception of almost every kind while we believe that we're following the will of God. We only want one thing. And what is that? The will of God. Where is the will of God revealed? The prophets reveal the will of God. You remember that the, the, the scriptures came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, they spoke as they were moved how? So these prophets, they were not giving the words of themselves or the words of man. These prophets were giving what? The words of God and the will of God. Now I wonder, do we have a prophet in these last days? Oh, that wonderful messenger of the remnant. In these latter days, God is still revealing his will, and he has never revealed it as clearly as he is revealing it today in both the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. And those that are going to be ready for the coming of Jesus, not only are they keeping the commandments of God, they have something else. What do they have? The testimony of Jesus. And what is that? That's the spirit of prophecy. Do you have it? I did not say, is it on your shelf? These books on our shelves will never make happy homes. Adventist home, messages to young people, ministry of healing in the Bible, we must take them off of the shelves and through the Holy Spirit, allow them to be brought into our hearts and live down in our lives. And the result is happiness. For if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Are you with me? 
So don't expect me to give you a plan that the world is following. We're going to follow here in this class the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah. What book did I say? Now my time is getting away from me. I got to move on. Amen. Hasten on. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah the 10th chapter. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we must understand that when we deal with this idea of relationships that are leading to heaven, God has given us stair steps to heaven, almost like Jacob's ladder. Every run around goes higher and higher, and God has given us steps to reach into the experiences in our relationship that reach heaven. He has given us steps, principles that lead to heaven. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah the 10th chapter, beginning in verses 23, let's read that together. Jeremiah 10, beginning in verse 23, what does the Bible say? It says, O Lord, I know what? That the way of man is not where? It's not in himself. Now watch the point. It is not in man that walketh to do what? To direct his steps. So the Bible says that the man of God, that God is going to be directing his what? His steps. Now can man direct his own steps? It is not a man. Now man can direct it, but where will his own steps lead him? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of destruction and death. And so, brothers and sisters, when we look at, at the steps that we're on, that the steps that we're walking, we must make sure that the steps of a good man are ordered how? After the Lord. Psalms 119 says, Psalms 119 says, go to Psalms 119, then we'll come back. Psalms 119, what book can I say? Psalms, the 119th division. And notice what the Bible says in Psalms, the 119th division. We're following that God's plan, he gives us steps. Are you with me? I want to read something to you. You're going to Psalms 119, but I want to read something to you about these steps. I'm in the book Adventist Home, page 49. Adventist Home, page 49. Notice what the prophet says in Adventist Home, page 49. It says, let every step. How many? Let every step toward a marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife, both in this world and in the world to come. A sincere Christian, a what type of Christian? Sincere. And there are some Christians that they have a name that they live, but they're dead. A sincere Christian, that's a true Christian. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. Now, I want you to see something specific here. Now, watch now. Watch now. Listen. It says, let every step toward a marriage alliance, which tells us that if we're looking in God's plan to enter into a marriage alliance, then there's going to be what? Steps. Let every step. Now, if there was only one step, would inspiration say let every step? What would I say if there's only one step? Let the step of marriage. Is that right? But the fact that inspiration says let every step shows that as we are looking to move toward the marriage alliance, there's more than one step. Are you with me? Let every step toward the marriage alliance. Now, the reason why this is important, because remember, the steps of a good man are ordered after the Lord. And it's not in man to direct his steps. You can't direct your steps as it leads to marriage. We must have God directing us in these steps. Now, brothers and sisters, most people, they only look as if there's only one or two steps. But I want you to see that if we are following and studying the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that there are at least seven steps. How many? And I want us to look at that. Go in your Bible to Proverbs. What book did I say? Well, let's read this first and then we'll go right to Proverbs. Psalms 119. We'll read it there. Psalms 119, the Bible says, and 134, Psalms 119, 134, let's read that together. The Bible says, 133, Psalms 119, 133, it says, order my steps, where? In thy word, and let not iniquity have, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. So these steps should be ordered after what? 
after the word. Both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we have the words of Jesus. Now in Proverbs 9, I have suggested that there are at least seven steps. Now when you study through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you might want to add more steps or you might want to use less steps. But for the sake of our study, you'll see why I chose seven. Proverbs chapter 9. What book did I say? Proverbs chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Proverbs chapter 9, beginning in verses 1. Let's read it together. Proverbs 9, beginning in verses 1. The Bible says, Wisdom have what? Have built in her house. She have hewn out what? Seven pillars. So this house that wisdom has built it, how many pillars that this wisdom build? Seven. Now these pillars are nothing more than principles in which a house is built upon. They are pillars. Pillars support a house. They support it. And the Bible says that this wisdom has hewn out how many pillars? Seven. These are seven principles which I have likened as inspiration does as seven steps that lead to an experience in marriage that is of heaven and not of this earth. And the problem is that the majority of people, they don't climb up these steps. You know that? The majority of people, they just run out and they have an urge. They want to be with somebody. And so they just run into, if anything, they'll run into courtship and into marriage. And they do what the world calls falling in love. You ever heard that? Now, where do you find that in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? In God's plan, you don't fall in love. In God's plan, you step into that experience. Might I remind you of a law of physics? You don't fall up. You can only fall down. And the people that fall in love, they end up very soon falling out of love. Into divorce and separation and all the rest. And even those who don't leave, they have an experience not like heaven, but like hell. Right here on this earth. Those who enter into the experience of love, they don't fall into it. They step into the experience. They climb Jacob's ladder because every round goes what? Higher and higher. They follow these steps. And if you don't know these steps, and I can tell you, you're not yet in that experience. You can be. Because that you cannot direct your steps. You can only find it in the word and in the testimonies of his spirit. What do you say? Now I want to know what these steps are. What do you say? You want to know these steps? Now the last step, I believe that every one of us can know what that is. What is the final step? What is the final step that we're moving toward? What is the goal of it all when God is leading two people together? Marriage. Is that right? My board is small. I normally would like a big board I can just write on. But we'll use this and we say it's marriage. So I just put M-A-R. We know what that means. The seventh step is the final step which leads and ends in what? In marriage. Now what is the step before marriage? Before marriage? No. Before marriage, engagement. Is that right? Now, what comes before engagement? Courtship. Thank you. And so the seventh step is what? Marriage. The sixth step is what? Engagement. The fifth step is what? But now, brothers and sisters, most people, when they think about stepping into this experience, moving toward this alliance, they run straight from an urge to want to be with somebody. And if they even understand something about God's plan, they rush into courtship, don't they? They see somebody in the church or somebody they're interested in, and they say, well, now she looks nice. She looks spiritual. He looks nice. He looks spiritual. I think we need to begin courting. But on our diagram, we have four steps prior to even courtship has ever entered into and most people have no idea what these four steps are. You see, the world, they skip these four steps. And they slide into what they call courtship and dating. And as a result, as we said, by sliding through these steps, they fall into love. And so we need to study what those four steps are. But that's not our study today. Uh, we'll come back to that. But my point is, I want to bring this in right here. What is courtship anyway? What is courtship? I'm taking a hand from the congregation. Let me see how much time I have because I want to build a case. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. What is courtship? I see a hand. Um, it's learning one another. 
Learning one another, all right. Someone else, what is courtship? You don't have to be afraid. We're in the class, amen? Well, it's not like I'm dating it. Courtship is preparing for marriage. It's preparing for marriage, all right. Sharing lifestyles. All right. Anyone else before we go on? Becoming friends. Becoming friends. Now, all these things have a part into it. But I want to give you something. You're taking notes. I want you to write this down. Courtship is a sincere and earnest effort of two. that are seeking to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. <coughs> Courtship is the sincere effort of two to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. What is courtship? Would you say it with me? A sincere effort of two to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. Now, this is totally different from dating. You see, in dating, many people think that you date this person, this person, this person, that person, this person, and they tell you, many adults sometimes will even tell you, that this gives you a broad-mindedness so that you understand and are qualified to better make a proper decision. You won't find anything remotely like that in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. That has originated from the apostate. You see, brothers and sisters, the way that we are to find out what God's will is, is not by dating this one and that one and that one. Tell me, do you know what's in that person even when you date them? A man's heart is deceitful above all things. You don't even know your own heart. And you want to know the heart of somebody else? No. You can't understand this by yourself. It is only in God to direct our steps. But multitudes believe that they have a broad-mindedness, and as a result, they go about dating this person and that one, and they set themselves up for failure. You know why? You see, a man at the marriage altar, he has to make a promise before God and holy angels when he stands at that altar. And he has to say, in his own way, he has to promise that he is going to forsake all others and give himself to that one woman, his wife, as long as they both shall live. And the, I mean, the man would say, will you do this? The pastor, the preacher at the appropriate time would say, will you keep yourself from all others? And that man has to say what? I do. He's promising. Now, if he would really be honest, following the world plan, he could not say, I do. Do you know what he had to say at the altar? And that marriage altar, he would say, you know, preacher, I don't know if I can promise that. He would have to say, because I have never done it in my life. I've gone out with whoever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I've never restrained myself. I've let my hands fondle whoever I wanted to fondle. I've let my words of love and affection go out to this girl and that girl and this girl and that girl talking to this one and then that one. He says, I have never have kept myself only into one because in my dating program, I've dated whoever I wanted to and as many as I wanted to. And as a result, how can he promise having never practiced it? But when you follow God's plan, long before that ever happened, you have been keeping yourselves from this. But someone says, well, then how will you know who is the right person? Well, brothers and sisters, the same way we know anything. The one who knows will let us know if we follow his plan. And these first four steps are to help us understand who God's plan is. These are preliminary steps that are before courtship that help us to stop wasting time with people that we should never even court. You see, courtship is not like picking a car or a carpet and we're just having fun. Most people think, well, let's just go together and we'll go to a movie here, a club here, or this place here, or even to church. And we can just date around and have a good time. Dating young people and adults is not for a good time. Did you know that? Now, someone says, do you mean to tell me that Courtship should not be beautiful and solemn and joyful. No, it should be joyful. But that which makes it joyful is not playing around. The presence of Christ brings fullness of joy. Courtship is a very serious thing. And the reason why marriages are so unhappy and unholy today is because courtships are carried on in a spirit of flirtation, just like the marriages. And somebody says, well, the rest of the world, they're doing it this way. Well, I told you, 99% of the world, they don't have happy homes, do they? Because they follow this program that the world is following. But you and I, we don't want our will. We want the will of God. Are you with me? 
Now, there are four preliminary steps. But even in these preliminary steps, my friend, these steps must be built on something. This building. Do I just lay this building down? What do I put on top of it? What do I have to put down before I can build a building on the ground? You have to lay a foundation. Every step, every staircase has to have a what? A foundation. And even people that know something about what we're talking about here. These seven steps, even before we get to the seven steps, there must be a broad foundation in which these steps are built on. Are you with me? In fact, go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? To the book of Luke chapter 6, and notice what the Bible says. You know when we look around the world today, oh, how many broken homes we see. Oh, how many broken marriages and relationships and hearts, broken hearts, all because of just one thing. And you know what it is? The majority have never been built on a proper or broad foundation. And the one who knows told us this secret. In the book of Luke chapter 6, notice what the great builder, that great carpenter, not only in the physical plane, but in the spiritual experiences of our life, notice what the great architect of the universe says. Luke chapter 6, beginning and verses 48. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says Jesus has given a parable. In Luke 6, verse 46, he says, And why call ye me what? Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I... He said, why do you call me Lord, and yet you won't even do what I tell you to do? And then he gives two examples of two different men that built their houses differently. And in verses 49 he says, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a what? Foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it did what? It fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The reason why so many houses have been ruined today is because they have not built it on a proper foundation. So even with these seven steps, it must be placed or built on a proper foundation. Now let's see what happened to the man who built on a proper foundation. What happened to him? What happened to him? Verse 48 says, He is like a man which built a house, and dig a deep, and laid a what? foundation on a rock and when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it for it was founded how upon a rock so a foundation was built and unless we build that foundation and you and I need to understand and that is what we're going to close on today what is this true foundation this broad foundation to the Christian home that these seven steps are built upon that we can lead into a marriage alliance and to a relationship that will prepare us for eternity for the kingdom of God and yea for translation itself oh I want heaven on earth what do you say but now let's see what it is and brothers and sisters, it says that the man who wants to build this house, he had to dig how? Now, there was a man that was telling me of an experience that happened in one of the great cities of our United States of America. He was in one of the great cities, and he was watching a crew build a great skyscraper. You know how high these skyscrapers get, don't you? Skyscrapers touch almost as it were the very sky. And as he was watching this, this man that was watching was unacquainted with the way that they build skyscrapers. So he was very amazed because before they built it, there was an excavation crew that was given the charge of digging. And when that man started watching this, he started looking and he noticed that they dug so deep into the ground, the man could not believe himself. And he asked the man that was in charge of this digging crew, he said, why do you dig so deep? You know the answer of the man? Because we're going up so high. <laughs> the higher that you must go, the deeper the foundation must be laid to support that which is resting upon it. Are you with me? So when we deal with the institution of the home, the institution of marriage, this is the greatest institution that God has ever created. Did you know that? Somebody says, well, what about the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for this purpose, to bring us to this experience. 
This is the greatest institution, and they go hand in hand. They cannot be separated or dissolved, brothers and sisters. Now, this is the case here. Do you know, and we're going to study, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to say something strange to you. But you believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, won't you? Do you know that in order to really build a successful marriage, it takes nearly 20 years? Did you hear what I said? Nearly 20 years to build a proper foundation for the marriage relation. Did you know that? Somebody said, that's strange, Pastor. Why does it take so long? Well, tell me, if I'm building a skyscraper that is hundreds of feet tall, will I finish it in a week? Two weeks. The bigger I build, the longer it and the reason why we have so many unhappy homes and so many homes that are so close to earth is because they rush into marriage. They don't give God enough time to lay the foundation so that when the storms of practical life burst upon them, their houses fall. Do you see? If you want your marriage to enter into heaven, the higher you build, the deeper the foundation, the broader it must be laid. And let me tell you this, sometimes it may take over 20 or 30 or 40 years because just the experience of years doesn't mean you have the foundation. You know that, right? Now, are, is, is there any woman in here that know how to cook? Praise the Lord. That, I, I hope the rest of you know how. We'll get there. But the point is, if you're going to cook some bread, what temperature do you think you put the bread on? What, 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 give me a temperature. You're, those of you who know about cooking, what, what temperature? 350? Is that, we'll take 350. How long, averagely, would you put the bread in for 350? Average time. 25, 30 minutes, hour? Somebody says 25, 30 minutes to an hour. Now tell me something. If I turn the temperature down to 10 degrees, would 30 minutes be long enough? Would it take longer? And I'll tell you this. In most homes that children are growing up in today, from infancy to adolescence to childhood, the temperature has never been turned up to build this foundation. And as a result, sometimes it might even take longer because we're not looking just at time. We are looking for an experience. I remember when my wife was teaching me how to cook. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we're in marriage classes. And I remember when I was learning about baking these things, she would have me stick something in there to test to see if it was ready. Now, I know the average time, but when you put something into it and you test to see if it's ready or if it's prepared, it doesn't matter if 20 minutes pass by. If it's not ready, you can't take it out unless you want bread that's what? Half-baked. And the majority of marriages today are half-baked. Did you know that? Over 99% of marriages in this room and all over the world, have, most people have never been married at the right time. Did you know that? Even if it's the right person, most people have never been married at the right time. And as a result, instead of heaven, it's something far less than that. I mean, think about it. I love fruits, mangoes. And the, here in California, you know about the persimmons, don't you? Oh, I love those persimmons. Amen. But now I ask you, what happens if I take a persimmon before it's ripe? What will it do to my mouth? That same persimmon? Yes. Why? Because everything is only beautiful in its time. And the majority of people today, they're in such a rush, in such a hurry to get into a relationship that they rush through the experience and they enter unprepared. And as a result, the, sweet of, the, the fruit of marriage, which should be sweet, is sour and bitter. Every fruit is that way, don't you know that? You can take the sweetest fruit in the world, but if you get it before it's ripe and ready, or it's going to be bitter. And that's what's taking place today. And what we mean by being ready is that this foundation must be laid. Are you with me? And so you may be 60 or 16. Unless this foundation is laid, you're not ready for marriage. Did you know that? You can be 80 years old and not ready for marriage. Because this foundation of heaven never been laid. Some people will never be ready for marriage. Do you know why Jesus is not here today? Do you know why? We are not ripe. We, the church, his marriage, he knows he has the right woman, the church. 
but she's not ready. And Jesus loves us enough to... Heavenly Father, in such a sacred room, in sacred service, help us not to be distracted, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, brothers and sisters, it's very important that we understand this principle of preparation. Are you with me? We need this foundation, this broad foundation to be laid. And while the foundation is great, it's very simple. Do you know what the foundation are? It's built on two things. This foundation is built on two things, and we'll use this to bring it to a close. It's built on two great principles, this, this preparation that we need. Number one is built on love. and self-control. What did I say? Love and self-control. And I would have us to think of it in three ways. Love and self-control. This is the foundation. And if we haven't learned it, whether we're 6, 16, or 60, we need to learn these principles because until we learn this, we're not ready for marriage. And you'll see why. It's just common sense. We'll see in a moment as we study. Now, Let's look at this for a moment. Now, when we think about love and self-control, these are not things that are not acquainted with each other. They are related. It's like a coin. Every coin has how many sides? Two sides. Every coin has two sides. And the two sides of this experience of preparation or foundation is love on one side and self-control. And I want you to think about it like this. In a car, how many pedals are there? How many? Two pedals. Well, if you get driving a stick, that means that you, you're operating yourself, aren't you? We're talking about an automatic. Amen. An automatic two pedals. The two pedals is what? The grass and the brake. Now, I want you to think of love as the power to go. Love as the power to go, the gas. Love as the power to what? And self-control as the power to stop, to slow down or to stop. Now, I don't know about you. But a good driver, he has to learn how to balance those two pedals, doesn't he? He has to learn how to go when it's time to go, and he has to learn how to slow down and stop when it's time to stop. And this tells me that this is the same way in this experience of courtship and marriage, we must learn love and self-control. Now tell me, would you want to drive in a car with a, a car that only has a gas? If it only has gas, I'm not driving with you. What if it only has a brake? You can't go anywhere. And most homes, either they're going so fast that they get into ruin, or they never go anywhere. We must learn love and self-control. And God intended that we learn this. Guess where God intended that we learn this? You know what the oven is that bakes this bread that prepares for wholesome marriage? You know what the oven is? I'm reading the messages to young people, the very last uh, page in this entire book, this wonderful volume, 466. Listen to what it says. It is by faithfulness to duty in the parental home that youth are to prepare themselves for homes of their own. Messages to young people, 466. It is by faithfulness to duty where? In the parental home that youth are to prepare themselves for homes of their own. So where are we to learn these lessons? God intended that we learn this in the home, but most people haven't learned it. In fact, we'll look at it this way. This is the oven. Now, I would have us think of love in three ways. Number one, I would have us think of love as manifested in obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my Commandments, obey. So the first principle is love is manifested in obedience. Number two, love is manifested in service. Now, a question might be asked, what is the difference between obedience and what? And service. Obedience is, being, is doing what you've been told to do. Service is doing what needs to be done, even if you haven't been asked to do it. You see, wonderful is that home 
that has children and young people and even adults that will simply look and see what needs to be done. There's the dishes. Mother didn't ask me to do it. Father didn't ask me to do it. But the dishes need to be done, so I'm going to do it. Are you with me? House needs to be clean. No one asked me to do it, but, but, but I'm just going to do it. Obedience is doing what parents have told you to do. Service is doing what needs to be done, even if you've never been asked. And a young person may not know it, or not, but when a young woman or a young girl learns to obey, when they learn to do what they've been asked, told to do, and when they learn to look around the home that to see what needs to be done, even when they're not taught to be, they are learning to be good husbands and good wives. Did you know that? Most people today say, if you don't tell me to do it, I'm not going to do it. You're not ready for marriage. You're not ready for marriage. And the last one is bearing responsibility. And this is very important. You see, brothers and sisters, it's a very serious thing to carry on a family, isn't it? I mean, think about the man. He has to be able to provide financially for his family. He has to be able to provide socially for his family. He has to be able to lead his family into an spiritual experience. It is a great responsibility. And the same with a woman. Isn't it a great responsibility to keep the home running as it should be run? And let me tell you this. The young girl that sleeps when her mother is making breakfast is preparing to let her husband get the breakfast that she should have prepared. And the young man that sees grass that needs to be cut, that sees work in the house that needs to be done, that sees the Stramley family struggling for money and does not work to support it, is simply preparing to let his wife suffer. Do you see? It is by faithfulness to the duty and the parental home that we are prepared, that we are baked, that the foundation is being laid for us to carry on homes of our own. Do you see the point? And unless we can learn these lessons of obedience, service, and responsibility, and I tell you this, young ladies, it takes more than learning how to bake cookies to keep a home running. It's one thing to bake cookies, but we can't eat cookies every day. All day long. It's a responsibility to be able to learn how to cook meal after meal, day after day. But remember now, not all I have to obey or all is not being done, so I need to do it, but to do it happily. To do it cheerfully. And when a young man or a young woman learns this in the home, do you know that God is preparing them for a successful marriage? Most pure children don't learn this today. Did you know that? Most adults don't even learn this today. You see, most of us think of love as selfishness. And I'm going to say this as we get ready to bring a, some closing points on this point of self-control. Someone was telling me, of a cartoon article that was shown. A cartoonist in the Saturday Evening Post pictured a couple that was getting ready to get married. They were standing at the marriage altar and they were both envisioning what the married life was all about. And as they were envisioning this married life, you know what the man was thinking? The man was sitting there in his vision, in his little corner, he was thinking of his wife bringing him breakfast in bed <laughs> on a silver tray with the paper with all the foods that he liked, and he's just sitting there with his little, all his necessities right there on that little pl tray, in that platter. And the woman on her corner, she was daydreaming too. <laughs> you know what her daydream was? She saw that she was getting breakfast in bed. <laughs> and on her tray was roses, and the food that she liked, and the different things that she wanted. Now while we might smile at that, do you know that's really what most people think of the marriage relation? They think of it as what they can get out of it. Husband thinking, I can enter in this because now I don't have to cook anymore. I don't have to be worried about this. I can enter into this union. This is what in the mind, selfishly, and the wife the same way. We have never been trained to think unselfishly, but if we would learn obedience and service and bearing responsibility, we would come to the point where cheerfully and happily we would be thinking not of pleasing ourselves, but of pleasing what? And until we learn that, we're not ready for marriage. I don't care how old we are. And then finally, self-control. And I'll look at three aspects of this. Control on the area of appetite. What did I say? 
affection. And the passions. In the early life. Appetite, we must learn self-control in the appetite and the affections, affections and the passions. Now when we say appetite, what are we talking about? Food, eating and drinking, is that right? You know that a child that is not taught to properly eat and drink at the right time. When they eat any time they want, whatever they want, ice cream and cake and all the things that, that are not healthy for our bodies, when they give in to the urges of their stomach, do you know, brothers and sisters, when they don't practice self-control, do you know that they are preparing to move into the area of the passions and not be able to control that? Did you know that? You see, the appetites and the passions are closely connected. And when a young person is not trained in infancy and childhood and adolescence to control their appetite, they are unprepared when they come to the teenage years to control the impulse that are running them to get into a connection with girlfriend and boyfriend and touching each other and kissing each other and finally leading, leading to the full breaking of the seventh commandment and fornication and adultery. They are not prepared to do it because they are not strong enough they have never built the muscle of self-control did you know that we look at people and we say how in the world could they fall to fornication and adultery how could they do it they look like they were spiritual in every other way but because they had never been practicing control here on the appetite and you know most of us have been trained to be indulgent from our infancy you know how when we give the baby Milk to drink at any time we want. Any time, every time they cry, we just put a bottle in their mouths. You know what it does? It trains them in a habit of eating what they want, when they want, and as they grow. You know the inspiration in child guidance tells us that we should have regularity with our children and with the babies for this very reason. Did you know that? God is getting us ready. Appetite and affections. What about the affections? That's who we are to love. You know who a teenager is to love? Boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, they're up in the teenage years. The people that we're to learn, where do we learn how to love husband and wife? Somebody says, it's in dating, going to this person, that person. We learn it in the parental home. By learning to love father and mother, brother and sister, auntie and uncle, by learning to love them, and most children get into what is called puppy love. You know what puppy love is? That's your, that is what you call uh, young love, long, young loving when you're too young. Most people do this. You know why? And I'm coming to a close. But most people do this. You know why? Those of you who know health, if a person does not eat the right amount of fruits, what do they crave? Sugar. And they interpret that craving as needing sugar and sweets when what they really need is what? More fruits. Most people don't eat the proper amount of fruits, fresh fruits. If you had enough fruit, you wouldn't even crave so much the sweets of candy and all the rest. It shows us, my brothers and my sisters, that we're lacking something. And the reason why most young people want a boyfriend and girlfriend so young is because they're craving for love in their own homes. You know how many young girls have been turned out by men because their fathers won't show them love and affection. Won't put their arms around them and hug them and kiss them and talk to them and have friendship with them, learning who you should love. Brother and sister are fighting with each other. And when a brother fights with his sister or mother and neglects them, you know, that man, that boy is preparing to fight with his wife. When a man neglects his mother he's just preparing to neglect his wife did you know that and when a woman does not show respect for her brother when a woman does not show respect for her father she's just preparing to disrespect her own husband and prepare a home that can never lead to heavenly places where do we learn this in the parental home this is the foundation, and I tell you, I don't care how beautiful your home is, that unless you have years of this type of training, you're not ready. Do you know that in courtship, it takes a tremendous amount of self-control? Did you know that? For a man and a woman 
who are attracted to each other spiritually and physically for them to be with each other and in company with each other and yet guard his eyes so that they're not sending love messages or guard his hands so he's not touching her where he should not be touching her or not embracing her as a lover embraces or not kissing her and all the rest that leads to the breaking of the fifth seventh commandment I tell you in order to control yourself to the point where you may think that possibly this might be my wife and yet control yourself I say it takes a tremendous amount of self-control and if you have not learned this in the parental home for years then your muscle is not strong enough and that's why there's so much premarital sex and adultery and fornication because I tell you on the marriage day when the vows are said God does not as a special gift give self-control did you know that self-control was the result of entering to this experience much earlier with him and if you haven't learned it we need to learn it when now this is the foundation let's get ready to bring it to a close in Luke 6 as we close today you know somebody says but pastor you're taking all the romance out of courtship oh yes a certain amount you see the time for romance and love should best be reserved for marriage did you know that inspiration said most of the courtship should be continued into the marriage you see the time for affection and the display of love is when every question has already been settled the reason why there's so many broken hearts is because you get so emotionally attached do you know that hormones are sent in your body whenever a man touches a woman God designed for hormones to be released in the body and it arouses that young man that young woman thoughts minds actions and brothers and sisters when that happens it begins to bring about emotional ties and so some people are so emotionally tied before they even know if it's God's one for them so even if they get counsel it's just a form they're not really listening they say oh we're going to get married I don't care what you say we're going to get married and what do you need God for? Do you see? And so brothers and sisters, the time for romance is when every question has been settled. And you know by the grace of God that this is the one. And that is that marriage and only even the words of love that we use sometimes. You know, in heaven, the Bible says we're going to get a new name. Is that right? Yeah. But it's not until we get to heaven. Some couples exchange love names. Baby. You're the one and only. How many girls have heard that only to find that they weren't the one and only? Those words, just as Jesus reserves them unto those who are going to be saved, should be reserved unto a settled that we have the right one. Is that right? And all of it is built on one thing. Luke 6 as we close 47 says whosoever cometh to me Luke 6 47 and hear of my sayings and what and do with him I will show you to whom he is like he is like a man which built an house and dig how deep and laid the foundation where on a rock here's that steps here's the foundation and it's laid where who was the rock? That rock was Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.4 This is why the experience with Jesus is the foundation of it all. Amen? And every young woman and every young man that wants only one thing. Not my will. Not this way, that way. Not my will, but thy will be done. Someone says, this is hard. Oh, yes, it's a hard saying. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that lead to life. And few there be that find them. If you're not willing to follow these steps, then all you're doing is inviting the devil to bring you to hell. 
I want happiness. What do you say? If this is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me? Oh, Father, we're so thankful that the Bible is clear. And that the spirit of prophecy does not lead us to direct our own steps. But that the steps of a good man are ordered after thee. They're ordered by your word and both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But every step must be built upon a great foundation of love and self-control. Lord, we just ask that all of this may be built upon a foundation as we learned last night of a relationship with thee because until a young man is placed in the hands of the Lord and until a young woman is placed in the hands of the Lord on that rock, they can't even build a foundation. And so help us just now that while our desires may be saying, well, Lord, I want this, I want that, I want this and I want that, that we may learn to control it even now by saying, Lord, not my will. Not what I think, but thy will be done. And if we'll learn this, Lord, you promised that we can have heaven on earth. Help every kneeling soul, every young person, every adult, that we may learn these lessons, that we might be prepared for eternity. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.